Hi everyone, <laughs> it's Ren here. Hope you are well, guys. Uh, before I start the video, just to remind you that I have written a book. Many of you will be aware of this already, but you know, if you're into Kafka, Dostoevsky, Marcel Proust, and all these great psychological novelists, the links are down below. It's not very expensive if you want to follow and support a fellow INFJ. The interview by myself. Good read. Okay, so today I wanted to make a video that may turn out to be a little bit longer than usual. So if you are interested, uh, stay with me, please, um, because it may or may not, depending on how good I am at simplifying these concepts, it may turn out to be a, you know, a slightly more challenging video than usual. Uh, because in this video I want to explore some philosophical underpinnings of Myers-Briggs typology and the Jungian perspective in general. I mean, you know, of course, uh, that Carl Jung was a philosopher, among other things. You know, he was a psychologist, but he was a philosopher, arguably in many respects as well. So, so you know, the intersection of, of philosophy and psychology in, in Myers-Briggs is nothing really surprising. But you could actually argue that there's not enough of that that's done in discussions of Myers-Briggs. It's taken for granted that the philosophy is whatever it is, the underlying philosophy. It's Carl Jung's philosophy, it's Myers and Briggs' philosophy, whoever authored whatever philosophy, you know, is kind of taken for granted. But it's rarely discussed what that philosophy is. And in this particular instance, I wanted to look at the question of philosophical underpinnings from the perspective of how we talk about the functions, how we talk about the cognitive functions. So as you know, in the case of an INFJ, that's introverted intuition as a dominant, and I extroverted feeling as an auxiliary, then TI and SE. So, um, so far, hopefully you're following me. Now, um, <clears throat> you may have noticed something um, that is a, quite, a, quite a problem, really, quite, quite a problem. Um, and that is that when we talk about the cognitive functions, it seems quite difficult to eliminate certain functions from our discourse when we're talking about a particular type. When I say eliminate, I don't mean, you know, completely eliminate them, but account for them as, as playing a, quite a minor part in, a, in an individual's psychological makeup um, and to, to take a very simple example if you picture let's say if you picture an ENFJ for example okay you picture an ENFJ so their dominance extroverted feeling um, their auxiliary introverted intuition then SE and TI and so on so as you can see that in the case of their makeup in the case of their function stack there is no introverted feeling, okay? So according to the theory of the shadow functions, the the introverted feeling in the case of an, I, an ENFJ would, would be in the fifth slot. But um, for the purpose of this, of this discussion, let's just say that FI is not in an ENFJ's function stack, okay? And yet, if you're going to talk about an ENFJ, you will notice that others and you yourself will find yourself saying, well, whenever th this person comes to ask themselves about their own values, about what they really believe in, at the moment when they have to make a moral choice and consult, you know, the arsenal of what constitutes, you know, their moral universe, that's FI. There's no way it cannot not be FI. In other words, there's this idea that the subjective functions are, in some sense, the functions of introspection. Okay, so we take subjective function, so, you know, introverted functions, if you like. Uh, so you have TI, FI, SI, and NI. These are the functions of introspection. That's how it's conceived of. And it then follows that surely, to the extent that, you know, an extrovert like an ENFJ is introspective and, and a morally 
upright person, they're going to be consulting their FI a lot. And, and you'll notice that you can apply that to any type and you'll realize that <clears throat> things like FI, TI, and so on, especially FI and TI because they're, they're functions of judgment, so very correlated with attitudes and actions, you'll notice that you cannot really eliminate them when you account for a person's behavior and personality. And so the, the proportion that FI takes, for instance, in the account of an INFJ and the NFJ's day-to-day -day is way too important to justify not including FI in their function stack. Because if you don't include FI in a person, in an individual's function stack, uh, even if you include them quite low in the stack, you know, that implies that whatever function you're talking about is not prevalent in that, in that person's conscious world and is mostly part of their own conscious world. Okay, so that's not gonna be the dominance in their life. And yet, I think the example, the example of FI in the life of an FE user is very telling because you'll just find that you have no way of explaining that person, essentially, their worldview, their actions, without saying, well, you know, whenever they're introspecting about a particular moral situation, that's FI. And so what are we to think? Are we to think that an, an the NFJ doesn't uh, consult their moral compass? Uh, why would they do it less than any other person? And so that's the problem. That's the problem because then why? What do you do? Well, what do you do? How do you explain that? And you can't really say, well, that's, you know, they, 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 they do consult it a lot, but it's all unconscious. I mean, to some extent, you could perhaps say that a little bit, but you can't just use that blanket statement to solve everything. And so that's a major problem. That's a major problem. It's exactly the same, by the way, with the INTJSTI. Like, I've talked to INTJs many times before, and I made some videos about INTJs, and I've had INTJs discuss in the comments. And most of them, what do they say? They say, well, I can use TI just as well as T. I just don't use it as much. Okay, like you'll be surprised how often INTJs say that actually they can use TI just fine. TI is okay, they can use it. So it would be the same as saying that an INFJ can just use FI whenever and that reflects my example about the ENFJ. So the question is, how is that possible and how is that not a severe violation of the coher coherence of the theory? You know, why do we just pass it by as if it was something just uh, kind, of, kind of an outlier that we can't explain, but somehow we think it's okay, even though it's actually not okay at all, right? So I think hopefully you get the sense of the problem. TI, very hard to eliminate in an INFJ stack according to their own description of how they operate. FI, very hard to eliminate from any FE user stack, basically, in their accounts of how they operate from our perspective or their own. And we just, we just don't know what to do with that. So now, comes the philosophy, okay? What I want to introduce you to is a distinction between two movements in philosophy, which you could call, broadly speaking, okay, internalism and externalism. And there are proponents on both sides, and it's possible to be completely honest with you that Externalism is a serious contender of internalism in academic circles, philosophical circles, consciousness, science circles, and so on, L linguistics circles. But in the population as a whole, uh, when you talk about people in the streets, so to speak, you know, in everyday conversation or ordinary society, people are still very much in the mode of internalism. And I don't know why I don't know why that's the case. I just observe it all the time. So my my hypothesis is, well, there's two hypotheses. I don't know which one is true. I don't know if either one is true. The first one is that it's not been long enough since externalism became more prevalent in academic circles. It really just sort of became influential in the 20th century, so we're talking about very recent developments in the grand scheme of things, in the grand scheme of history. So it just hasn't had time to to, to get sedimented yet in, in the layers of society. Um, the other hypothesis is it's less intuitive and 
therefore it's a lot harder to understand you know and you, you could draw an analogy with with relativity for example or the theory of gravitation and bodies like sort of you know attracting each other uh we think of gravitation or you know gravity is like dropping an apple and but actually the earth is also going toward the apple and it's like you know that's counterintuitive people don't think like that it's hard to understand so it could be the same with externalism now because internalism has been dominant for so long it probably has become encrusted in people's minds but now that i've said that i need to give you a little bit more detail on you know what these difference what, what these two broad movements mean uh, i'm going to boil them down and so if there are any philosophers in my viewership you hopefully uh, I, I won't raise your hair <laughs> because because i'm going to simplify a little bit but broadly speaking what you could say is internalism, as it has been really the dominant view, right? The, the dominant epistemological view in this case, the dominant view of knowledge uh, and the acquisition of knowledge and, and the manipulation of knowledge and language. Internalism suggests that there are things that exist in us in essence, and they are, they are within us, and they are present within us, they exist within us, and that's independent of our external environment in, in a lot of ways. So, you know, someone who thinks that there are by nature people who are good and by nature people who are not as good as, or people who are evil, you know, that's an internalist view. Um, if you take uh, another example, which is a little bit more technical, if you're familiar with the word or work of Noam Chomsky in, in, in regard to language and grammar, now, he's a, he's a very influential internalist. In fact, he contributed to, to an internalist revival with his work in opposition to some externalists of the like of... Um, um, I mean, I'm trying to, to think of anyone that you, you, might, uh, you might know. Uh, but, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of these philosophers are relatively... Uh, well, they're specialists. So Saul Kripke would be would be a, <clears throat> a very big name in that field, or Hilary Putnam would be another big name in that field. Externalists have a different view. Now, what does that mean? It means that for, for Chomsky, language is something that is within us. It's innate. It's internal in that sense. Well, it, it's, it's, it ha it's an in inherent potential for growth, and it grows within, within us. Now, an externalist about language would say that we learn language by exposition to our environment by exchanging with other people and like the, the meaning of words and the signs are in, in they, they, they are sedimented by this interaction between the subject and its environment. In fact, even talking about the subject would be a little bit dubious for an internalist. So from the perspective of an externalist, there is the potential to develop language, but that, that does not have to happen. And we are kind of a blank slate in that regard, whereas for, for Chomsky, he considers that there's tremendous evidence that the the fact that grammar, particularly grammar, the structure of grammar being so similar across different societies, so that there is a possibility of, a, to a large extent, mutual translatability between languages, suggests that it's not possible that the environment is the main factor in the acquisition and development of language but that it is something that grows within us in the first place and that you know we, we might find that surprising but that that is the only way in which this this uniformity of the development of grammar is observed among like prodigious thousands you know of, of of linguistic communities so that's another example you have the externalist view about language versus the internalist view you know and in the case of morality like so, to say that an individual is is responsible for his actions, but to to the extent that you know he has not been entirely shaped by society, um, and so that to some extent, if, he, if he's had a very rough childhood and and his life has been tough and tough economic conditions, and and maybe maybe par the, you know one of the parents was an alcoholic or something like that, the more you account for his morality and for his actions in terms of that framework. Uh, of in influences, the more you have an externalist view on on morality in this case, okay? And <clears throat> now, why is this interesting and relevant to, to the case at hand about FI, TI, the INTJ, the ENFJ, and, and that problem that those the functions pose and how to eliminate 
certain functions from our account of certain types that are not supposed to feature those functions as much as they end up featuring when we actually give a description of, of, of their personalities. The, the, the fact is that we are in the MBTI community, as I can see, is very much under this way of the internalist view. Okay, and because we are under this way of the internalist view, and by the way, that would also have been Carl Jung's position, because a lot of the great externalist philosophers who came to prominence in the 20th century came to prominence decades after, after Carl Jung died. Um, so he couldn't really have known, if you like. Um, the, now, the idea is that, that's, that's, that the, the theory of the functions is permeated by this idea of, of internalism, essences, you know, we, are, we have innate traits. And that applies to the to question of the judging functions and that can be easily shown. Because if at some point you, you're faced in a particular situation and you're an ENFJ, okay? You're an ENFJ and, and you have to consult your moral compass, right? If you're an internalist, well, you're obviously going to assume that yes, your moral compass is in the first place internal. But if it is internal, then it has to be subjective, and if it's subjective, then it's the product of a subjective function. And if it is the product of a subjective function, then it has to be FI, and then you're locked in having to admit, having to acknowledge that FI features very prominently in the life of an ENFJ, and so you have to kind of, either you, you can try to fix the problem somehow, or you can just say, well, or the worst thing to do would be to say that's not an issue, because actually it is a glaring issue for the, the theory and the model. But you can also say, well, that's, you know, that's, that's something that, that, that the, the theory just cannot accommodate. It, it's, it's, it's where it doesn't actually describe reality as well as it could. And, and that's fine. And it's part of what makes the theory scientific. It's, it's limitations. But notice that if you have an externalist view, if you take an externalist view on, 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 the, on this question, and that would be quite, you know, a novel uh, approach to take. But I think at least... A healthy dose of externalism in, the, in this case uh, would be helpful in resolving the paradox because then it's a totally different thing. You'll say, yeah, like, of course, within myself, I have certain affects, certain, you know, uh, convictions. But these convictions that exist within me only become concrete, only become tangible only become real as these positions, as these moral convictions, as these moral statements, as these moral judgments, once I have made sense of them in language, once I have made sense of them in external concepts, because language and external concepts, well, are precisely parts of our environments in the externalist view, the actual position only comes to life once it is out there. And so you don't have to, 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 to conceive of it as, 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 a, as a product of pure subjectivity. Your subjectivity plays a role, of course, just like it would play the role in the case of an actual introverted feeler. But if you like, it is only when it, once it's out there that it takes its full form as a judgment. But once it's out there and can take its full form as a judgment, then there's no problem with saying that it is actually formed by an extroverted feeling. What comes from you is not the substance of the judgment, okay? Or rather, what comes from you is the potential of the judgments, but the actualization of the judgments is done externally, in words, and with society around you. And in that case, that's fine. You can actually use the account of extroverted feeling to explain how an ENFJ comes to reckon with their moral convictions. The reckoning is internal, but the actualization of the reckoning is external. And so you have solved your problem. Now, I don't really have time to talk about TI and the INTJ, but depending on how you take, receive this video and if it makes any sense to you, I probably will try to see if I can use externalism to resolve that problem also. All right, it's been a long video, so Take a break now. It's been heavy. Take care. See you soon.